Our first presentation today is Which Wood is Which? Exploring Wood Identification in Museum Collections with Akiko Takasu and conservator Greg Kelly. They will explore the impact of wood identification on culture, biodiversity, and global economy. Using a 1,000-year-old wooden object, a statue of a Shinto female deity from Rom's Japanese collection as an example, they explore the importance of identifying materials for a better understanding of provenance and historical context surrounding an object's creation. Beyond provenance and context, wood identification is also essential in contributing to the control of the illegal lumber trade, which contributes to threaten our planet's biodiversity. Akiko Takasu is the Bishop White Committee Associate Curator of Japanese Art and Culture here at ROM, and Greg Kelly is a furniture conservator and cultural heritage conservation and field unit liaison Indigenous Affairs and Cultural Heritage Directorate at Parks Canada. Welcome, Akiko and Greg. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Akiko, and this is Greg. And we are talking about wood identification. So first, I'll talk about the role of wood identification in the cultural sphere. And then Greg will speak about the methodology of wood identification and the current challenges from a broader perspective. So the objects I'm talking today is this a wooden statue from Rome's Japanese collection, figure of female Shinto deity. Uh, for those who are not familiar, familiar with Shinto, Shinto is a, 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 it's a folk belief system unique to Japan. So it's not really religion in the sense of Buddhism or Christianity, but it existed since ancient times, and it's centered around uh, uh, nature and ancestor worship. And we, we sometimes uh, with a personified deity like our statue. And this statue may look like Buddhist sculpture, but then it, the difference is that the Shinto statues are not meant to be shown to the public. So these statues are kept inside the shrine. But only after the late 19th century, they became available for collection, and that's why it's at the Rome's collection too. And here is the basic information, object information, but this is actually the old ones before the wooden analysis we did. So we knew that it was carved from a block of wood, but we didn't know what type of wood. And the dating was approximately considered like from 10th to 13th century, so the statue was considered as 700 to 1,000 years old. But with a question mark. And um, Rome purchased it in 1957 from an American dealer. And since then, it has been considered as one of the highlights of our Japanese collection. So if anyone has visited the previous Japanese gallery, this uh, statue was shown, but it's currently not on display. But you can uh, access it online, online collection. And as you can see, the, it's, a, it's a sitting, uh, no, sorry, it's standing statue. And this form is rather uh, uncommon as a Shinto statue. And Shinto statues are usually on a sitting pose. But this is a standing, and it's, its height is about one meter, so this height. So in 2021, we had a chance to have this statue uh, tested for wooden identification. And the test was uh, conducted by Dr. Tazuru and Merz, based in Kyoto and Germany. But first, our conservator of organic material, Jean Dendy, took tiny, tiny samples from the um, post part of the statue here. As you can see, it's, it's very tiny samples, and sent it to the lab. 
And in July 13, 2021, we received the report from the lab by uh, Dr. Tazuru and Meltz, Dr. Meltz. And yes, the, the method of the test is explained here, but then, unfortunately, I cannot talk about it, but then Greg will tell us about it later. Then the result. Result was that uh, the wood was identified as magnolia, in Japanese, honoki. This was quite a surprise because um, similar wooden statues from the similar periods were not identified, but then identified uh, as other wood, such as hinoki or kaya or etc., but very rarely as honoki. So this was quite a uh, precious information for us to learn about the object. Uh, for your information, this is Honoki. And further, the wood sample was dated, and the result was uh, between uh, 1079 and 1155 AD with a 67.45% probability. That means um, from late 11th century to the mid 2012th century. So now we have more accurate information about the object. So we know the type of the wood, it's magnolia, and more accurate dating of, so we narrow down between late 11th century to the mid 12th century. So no more question mark, which is great. So museum curators like me are always looking for as accurate as possible information about the object. So I was very, very happy to find this, uh, to have this result. What is more important is that this information is also helpful to find out the history of objects and the previous ownership, a kind of uh, research called provenance research. And from the beginning, this, uh, the provenance of this statue was kind of mysterious because the dealer uh, from whom we bought uh, this statue in 1957 told us that it is part of a group of 15 similar statues. Um, and, the, oh, and probably from uh, Izumo city in Shimane. In, in the western part of Japan, as you can see here. And he, so these are the letters from that um, dealer in, yeah, in 1957. He also told us that the, our statue, statue was owned, previously owned by a famous Japanese painter, Umehara Ryuzablo, which is also a very interesting story. So our previous curators, try very hard to find out the uh, uh, history of this statue, asking, you know, sending these letters to Japanese scholars, but unfortunately no response has have been, um, uh, came, have come back, unfortunately. And also, Japanese scholars did some survey when they came to Rome in 1970s and 80s, and saw this statue, and then they knew that there were other statues in other American museums too, but they didn't do any further research to connect these uh, statues. Right now, we know that uh, there are 18 similar statues around the world, exist around the world. For example, there are three female deities that, that are very similar to ours in Metropolitan Museum in New York, Sainsbury Institute of Art in the UK, and Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, and possibly in Japan too. And other types of statues like these are around the world. And I don't have pictures, but then these are all the 18, uh, 18 statues possibly related to, related to each other. And this group of statues has become a subject of recent research by an external team of scientists and art historians who did an extensive research on this, this um, group. 
and uh, wood analysis as well. So the wood identification done on our statue was part of, you know, part of this larger project. So after this analysis, now, um, and as well as a few past separate research, we now know that 10 out of 18 statues are identified as magnolia. As mentioned, magnolia is a rare material for this type of statue. It means that uh, this, this group of statues may have come from the same origin and possibly made at the same time. So these are the part of the statues who are identified as magnolia, including ours. So now further research is being done. Uh, one of the scientists, Dr. Tazuru, is doing uh, published uh, in Japanese, more detailed research. And I myself is part of further provenance research on this group with uh, two other art historians. Um, our Research is still ongoing, so we have found a little bit more, but then I cannot tell you right now. <laughs> but hopefully I can, we can publish uh, the findings soon. So in any case, I have been showing that uh, wood identification plays a crucial role in an extensive research on uh, cultural objects like this. And now I'm handing the mic to Greg. Great, uh, thanks Akiko, and welcome everyone. So, let's see. Keeping in mind the inter interdisciplinary approach to this project, I was reminded of the Ram motto, the old Ram motto, the record of nature through countless ages and the arts of man through all the years, which are on either side of the Western entrance. They're meant to inspire wonder, and build understanding of the human cultures and the natural world. And I think this project illustrates that as it combines art, nature, and science. Uh, so we're going to look at sort of basically roots to shoots. We'll look at uh, features and structures, softwoods and hardwoods, importance of identifying wood, and how do we identify wood. So wood is the vascular supportive tissue of trees. Between the cambium and the bark is the phloem. The phloem transports sugars, proteins, and other molecules in two-way flow uh, created by photosynthesis. And by the way, dead phloem becomes the bark of the tree. On the inside of the cambium is a xylem, and the xylem transports and stores water and water-soluble nutrients in a one-way flow system from the roots to the crown. Xylem also uh, adds support to the tree because it's stiffened with lignum. Here's an image of the structural planes. So when we identify wood, we really have to understand the struct the, these structural planes. And like geometry, we have a cross section across the top of the log. We have a radial plane, which is radiates out from the center. And the tangent to a radius is our radial section or radial side. So another part of wood is wood is anastropic. That means it has different properties in different directions. And for example, the uh, tangential section or uh, tangential side shrinks at twice the rate than the radial side. That's one example. Longitudinally, wood doesn't shrink very much. Uh, and wood, you can think of as a bunch of drinking straws that go up and down axially or horizontally as rays. So, um, wood can basically be divided between softwoods and hardwoods. Uh, softwoods are conifers, hardwoods are deciduous. The key difference between a, uh, uh, them is how their seeds develop. Softwoods are gymnosperms and they grow needles and cones. Hardwoods are angiosperms and they have leaves and flowers. So, Simple forms of wood first appeared at least 400 million years ago, a time when all plants were small and herbaceous. Softwoods originated in Europe about 310 million years ago. Softwoods evolved first and have a simpler cell structure than hardwoods. And softwoods, so softwoods have tracheas that conduct water, sap, 
and support, and sometimes have resin canals. And softwoods also have ray tracheids for inducting sap and also uh, parenchyma uh, cells for food storage. So basically here. So you're most, mostly uh, tracheids going up and down, for example, and then the rays are there. Where uh, hardwoods, which developed about 150 million years ago, um, they have a more complex cell structure. So uh, they have mostly fibers for support, along with vessel elements to conduct sap and water, and ray cells to conduct sap, along with parenchyma cells for food storage. And here's an example here. Okay, and there, those are the vessel elements, the pores, and, uh, and fibers are running up and down also. By the way, within a growth ring, you have early wood and late wood, and the early wood, uh, it's when the tree is growing faster with more uh, sunshine and, and rainfall and that kind of thing. And so the, the cells themselves aren't as, uh, the walls aren't as dense, are not as thick. Uh, late wood, the, wells, the, the cell walls start to thicken up a bit. So that's why you see a light color and a dark color in a growth ring. So the light color is the early wood and the dark is the late wood. Here are some uh, examples just of the soft, uh, the softwood cells, just so you can see them more in detail, and hardwood cells. So you can see there the hardwood cells, there are more of them and more features. Part of identifying wood and part of what uh, affects and changes the look of a, a species are stresses that it encounters. And so you have abiotic stress, um, which uh, has a negative impact on the trees, and that includes things like drought, salinity, low and high temperatures, and other environmental extremes. And then you have the more, the more organic uh, stresses, the biotic stresses, and these include more like pathogens, bacteria, fungi, viruses, nematodes, insects, and others. And within a tree genus, wood structures can differ significantly due to these uh, stress factors. So there are about approximately uh, 60,000 species of trees in the world, and uh, about 30% of this is covering the earth. And I took this image at the uh, Jodrell Libra uh, Laboratory at Kew Gardens. And I thought what was interesting is, if you look at the top row, most people would probably think that the wood you're looking at is mahogany. And you look at the bottom row and you think pine. And in reality, these are all different species. So within our sort of most people sort of know about 10 woods. You look around your home and sort of familiar things, uh, objects at home, and, and you kind of know, oh, that's pine or mahogany or oak, but in reality, there they could be something else. So the trade in illegal timbers is recognized as a threat to biodiversity. Resolution 23.1 was adopted by the United Nations in May 2014, promoting the development of tools and technologies that could be used to fight against illicit trafficking of timbers. So wood identification is, a, is fundamental to uh, facing the challenge of illegal logging, and uh, especially for determining species and geographic origins. And the United Nations has also estimated that the uh, cost, the global cost for illegal lobbying, logging is about 157 or 152 billion US dollars a year. And that accounts for about 15 to 30% of all the wood traded globally. So it's an astounding number. So as an example of protecting the, uh, the, the trade of woods, uh, there is CITES, which is the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. And along with current laws and other certification schemes, this provides a way to protect overexploited species and, the, and control illegal trade. And without species validation, the economic incentive to provide false information is substantial. The timber is easily misattributed to circum circumvent uh, trade regulations. So environmental laws exemplified by the US Lacey Act require that declaration of full scientific name with genus and species. By the way, when we do wood identification, cellular wood identification, mostly we can only go to genus, not species. That's because since logs and sawn timber, they lack the morphological character of leaves, fruit, seeds, and flowers traditionally used in species determination. And accurate anatomical identification down the species level, uh, both rapidly and in the field, can be very, very challenging. So as a result, there are several uh, separate uh, scientific disciplines that have focused their attention on this problem. 
So this just gives you an idea that, well, one is there's no scientific methodology that can address all timber identification questions related to genus, species, geographic origin, age, and individual species. And as Akiko mentioned, uh, radiocarbon dating was done on the Shinto deity here at the ROM. That's an example of, uh, of how we determine age. It's one of the methods. Other methods, as I say, uh, anatomical analysis, uh, which I'm involved with. Uh, 3D imaging using a synchrotron radiation uh, is another. Uh, there are other chemical and um, genetic ways of doing it. Now, one of the uh, sort of... Um, uh, challenges to chemical and genetic testing is you need to develop a database of knowns to compare against. So microscopic examination is still the only way where you have an unknown. And the 3D imaging helps you to, as another way to look at the unknown, uh, look, to look at the anatomical uh, images. So here's an example uh, looking at slides um, for traditional microscopic examination. Uh, by the way, this technique sort of been a staple technique for the last hundred years. And so what you're looking at on the top left side, it's a microtome, small microtome. And basically it's like a salami slicer. You put a little block of wood, maybe two millimeters by two millimeters by two millimeters in, and a little cube, and, uh, and then you take single cell sections, and then you mount them on a slide. You stain them, and then mount them on a slide. And when you stain them, we stain them different colors uh, to help us better uh, see the structures. So this is an example of the red, a saffron and O. So it stains cellulose and lignin. Uh, I don't, uh, with blue, you could use uh, astro, uh, saffron O. You could use astro blue for staining um, uh, non-lignified areas. And here's an example. So you've done your, your sectioning and you, you mount your, uh, your samples, and this is what it looks like under a microscope, different 100 time, or 40 times, 100 times, 400 times magnification. And so what you're looking at here is a cross-section at the very early part of this presentation. We talked about the, the, the structural planes, and we have a cross-section, and we have a tangential and a radial uh, side. And it's all the same piece of wood. It's just different perspectives of the same thing. And as you can see, it gives us a very different look at uh, the, the three dimensions. And so basically what you're looking at is in this example of Magnolia obovata, uh, which the Shinto deity could be or it could be just an unknown species of Magnolia. Uh, but you are looking at things like here. These are the vessel elements for conducting water up and down. Uh, and this is part of the, uh, the growth ring. Uh, in the tangential section, we're looking at things like these are the rays. And we'll do things like we'll count how many across, like one, two, or three, four, that kind of thing. Uh, that's part of what we're doing. We're looking at uh, up and down here, how many. We're looking at those. They're called perforation plates. And there's little lines here called helical thickenings. They're all part of the um, way we look at uh, timber. By the way, for hardwoods, there are about 41 features we're looking at, and softwoods, about 33 features. And in the radio section, we kind of look at this blocking. It's like bricks, like a brick wall, right? And here we have little, this, the top margins, we have little more upright, little square things. So they're all di diagnostic features we're looking for. Oh, I think that's gone past one. I don't know how to get it back now. Do you know how to get back? Oh, it's back. Oh, red one, there. Thank you. Okay, one more forward. Hmm, okay. Uh, there should be one slide in between. Let's see if it's there. Hmm, okay. Uh, this is now from the two-dimensional in the slides. We now look at the three-dimensional. And so what's being done now in current research, for example, is using a synchrotron to create um, imaging. And so they're taking even smaller samples now, and through uh, computer generation, they're able to build up this, um, the, uh, the uh, imaging and so, for example, this is being used on another uh, Shinto deity. Um, and uh, you can see here on, uh, here is in the two dimension, now being rendered in three dimensional form. Oh, I want uh, another image. I see what happened. Sorry. This image. Um, so this is the, uh, the synchrotron in Hyogo uh, Prefecture in Japan, which was used to uh, do the imaging for that Shinto deity sculpture. And so basically how it works is you have a ring, right? 
It's a huge building with a ring. And an electron gun fires a bunch of electrons through a steel tube into a booster ring. And then microwave energy is used to accelerate the electrons up to nearly the speed of light. And the electron beam is then injected in the synchrotron storage ring. And when the path of these high-speed, high-energy electrons is bent by magnets inside the storage ring, a natural phenomenon occurs to produce an extremely brilliant light, millions of times brighter than the sun. It's like a laser. So beam lights capture, manipulate, and direct this light onto samples. And then the interaction of the light with the molecules in the samples allow scientists to obtain a very detailed image of the molecular structures, as well as very detailed chemical analysis. Now we're going to go back past that. And in Canada, we're fortunate to have our own um, synchrotron. It's at the University of Saskatchewan, and it's run by the Canadian Light Source. And so, uh, there, by the way, there are approximately 70 synchrotrons in the world. And the one here in Canada, um, it has about uh, 20, it started in 2005, and it has about 25 different experimental stations within the building, within the, uh, the synchrotron. So many, many projects can be running at once, and they do really varied things by looking at uh, composite material for the aerospace industry, a lot of biological things, a lot of things really to cancer research. So it's a very, very interesting field. So, and it's uh, quite interesting, it can be applied to wood identification. And it really shows, again, this melding of the arts and culture and science all coming together. So that basically concludes our part. And we have some questions, and I know it takes time for people to get comfortable to ask questions, so I'll, I'll ask a, Akiko a question first. And sure. So Magnolia, I, I, I have a feeling as a wood conservator that probably Magnolia is chosen for sculptures because it's accessible, you can get it. And maybe it's, a, it's something you can carve, but are there any um, other ideas that you have, uh, Akiko? Yep, that is... Uh very good question. Thank you, Greg, for asking. So that's the, the, the very thing that uh, uh, researchers are now looking at, and as well as art historian, including me. And, but uh, for example, Dr. Tazuru, who was a wood analyst, she's doing more historical, social, or even more spiritual aspect of the choice of this wood, magnolia, for this a particular type of statue. Um, it's, it's not certain yet, so I cannot say anything certain here, but then researchers, all researchers have agreed that the choice was quite intentional. It's not just only because it was available, they chose it, no, there should have been some more positive reason why they had to use this uh, type of uh, wood, but the reason to, to, to support this, uh, this uh, yeah, theory it hasn't been established yet. But so we are just looking forward to, you know, uh, investigate and investigating in more detail. So, okay, so if you have any question, please come to the uh, mic over there. Thank you, yes. Excellent talk, thanks very much. <clears throat> uh, as a lay person, uh, I'm familiar with uh, the old concept of chronodendrology, which would be matching sizes of tree rings against some kind of a catalog. Is this no longer being done? Yeah, it's, it's still being done, and in fact it was done on uh, one of the, uh, part of that group of uh, eight, it was 18 sculptures yeah. identified uh, for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was done for that, and what was interesting was they could place the way the sculpture was taken out of the log, basically, um, if you quarter a log, um, the, uh, the, the Shinto Dei sculpture is taken out of the quarter with sort of the, the, the chest facing the tangential side. And it's still being done as dendrochronology to, to, to uh, determine uh, origin, geographic origin. Would that be uh, destructive? Would you have to take a core through the whole uh, uh, statue? I think you can, in this case, you don't have to core anything. You can just see at the bottom of the statue the growth rings. So it's not destructive. Uh, question about the genetic material or the methodology. Uh, is, is there any material still preserved after a thousand years in the wood that you can actually uh, test for genetic material? Yeah, it's a good question. I think for genetic testing, and by the way, at the University of Guelph, there's the uh, human, uh, there's, sorry, there's a, uh, oh, I forget it off the top of my head, but basically there's a, 
uh, group there doing DNA testing and that kind of thing. Uh, for wood, uh, perhaps at that age, it, it doesn't yield so much. And also when wood is heat treated, it doesn't yield so much genetically. Um, it's one of the challenges for genetic testing. Um, when I was in, um, in England at uh, Kew Gardens, which uh, was wonderful to see all those woods, um, because they seem to have one of everything, uh, going back to Charles Darwin, I guess, or maybe even earlier, um, there was a, um, a, a small tree outside. It was um, about a 24-inch circle of uh, wire around it, uh, stood about six feet high, and apparently it had been thought to be extinct for a very long time. And it was found in a mine in Australia, and uh, they were talking about um, cultivating it and selling it to the public again since it was rediscovered. Do you know what that was? It was right outside, which kind of shocked me if it's that rare, you know? I, I kind of, again, off the top of my head, I, <laughs> I, and not seeing it. Um, I don't know what it is, but have a good feeling. And basically, if you go on the internet, you do your Google search, get down that rabbit hole, and you look for like oldest trees in the world. Uh, there is, uh, I think it starts with an A. There is something that I am aware of, I just don't remember what it is, uh, that fits that description. It's a small, kind of more bush, herbaceous kind of thing that. Exactly. One more question What's the rarest wood? And I'll leave it at that. What do you think is the rarest of the woods? The rarest of the woods for like all trees, or where's wood used in maybe, objects? Maybe both, or whatever you have time. For. <laughs> hmm. Uh, I don't really know, but uh, um, I think like the image of the pine I showed you in California is a really rare one, extremely rare. It's because it's up in the mountains and that kind of thing. Uh, the most unusual one I've dealt with in my career is partridge wood. So. Welcome. And it has a very, partridge wood, sorry, it has a very distinctive feature of kind of, mm, how do I explain it? Like little elliptical, light colored elliptical ellipses on a dark background. Okay, perhaps the last question. Yes. Okay. Uh, Kiko, what do you know about the cultural significance of magnolia, mm. uh, if any? Do, do we know, could that be a reason why it is being used in a Shinto setting? Thank you for that question. Um, I don't know the um, exact reason, um, the reason for the cultural uh, significance of the choice of magnolia for this particular statue. That's exactly what other researchers are looking for. And uh, honoki in general um, in Japan is, I think, quite uh, not, not uncommon. I think it, it can be found in many areas of Japan, but uh, for some reason, we haven't found any religious statue, including Shinto and Buddhist, Buddhism statues made of honoki. There are a few examples, but not many. So maybe there was a kind of uh, cultural taboo not to use this type of uh, wood for religious sculpture. We don't know, but that's that's exactly what everyone was trying to find out right now. So I think in the near future I can answer that question more clearly. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you.